Uh, ben Davis High School, where I excelled in wrestling. I joined ROTC, which is a Marine Corps program. Uh, I met Sergeant Major Blankenship there and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Thompson and them two gentlemen. One, Sergeant Major had served in Vietnam like my grandfather and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Thompson had served in the Gulf War and both of them, you know, really, uh, really set an example for me, you know, to live by in the day to day, you know, they just carried themselves well and I, I looked at them, you know, in awe that they was able to handle such stress, you know, an environment like Ben Davis with the uh, amount of students that they have there and uh, the types of attitudes that may or may not come from certain students like myself, you know, give them a hard time being rebellious at a young age. And uh, I just, I, I like the way they carry themselves with tact and poise and honor and respect. And, you know, and I, I started to, you know, ingrain those uh, thought processes like the Marine Corps had instilled in them. And by the time I graduated high school from Ben Davis, I had already made up my mind that, you know, I was going to be a United States Marine. Uh, December 10th, 2007, not long after graduation, there was a couple months there that we uh, kind of... We're away with the wind in summer. Uh, I was on the yellow footprints, and my life changed forever. You know, that was that was it for my childhood. I remember being at prom and laughing and joking about where we were gonna do after graduation. And you know, six months later, I was I was told I was going to war and to get ready because the guy next to me, or the guy to the left of me, or me, one of us were gone. So uh, I took that to heart. I took it to grain uh, boot camp. They said that to me, and I, whew, wow, that was real. You know, I took it to heart, took it to the soul. I was like, all right, I got to pay attention. I got to be good at this. I got to be the best. This is the best, and if I'm going to be with the best, I'm going to be the best. So from then, I excelled. I was uh, instantly the squad leader in my platoon and boot camp, graduated squad leader, and it gave me a meritorious promotion. I graduated E2. I went to... SOI thereafter and in SOI, I had a couple awards given to me for um, outstanding physical merit. I think it's in here somewhere. We can look around. Oh, we're knocking stuff down. But that's what Marines are good at. We break things. Yeah, here. So, United States Marine Corps, Private First Class Zachary Arnold, for having successfully attained a score of 300 in the United States Marine Corps' physical fitness test, Infantry Training Battalion School of Infantry. So, that was the 20th of May in 2008. So in the short three months, 13 weeks of time, December 10, 2007 to 20 May, 2008, the Marine Corps trained me to be an instrument of warfare, to be used for a cause, rather that be your cause or my cause. After I get back from the 31st Mew, we get new Marines and old Marines leave. The Marines who trained us, who had just gotten back from Iraq, they were in Fallujah, they trained us how to be the best Marines that they could train us to be. And the only time they had to train us in was the time that we spent overseas training with and training other countries. So not a lot of actual hand-to-hand -hand training was actually um, discussed when it had to come to do with kinetic warfare and, and firefights and casualties and war, you know. So, we came home and we trained for war. Now, as senior Marines, I was a corporal at this time. I got promoted quickly. I was meritoriously promoted to Lance Corporal and then meritoriously promoted to Corporal and then Ultimately, now I'm a sergeant, and I was also meritoriously promoted to sergeant. We trained our new Marines how to go to war. I'd never been to war. So it had caught me rather funny that I was training my Marines that I was to be in charge of and take to war with me how to conduct themselves in a kinetic environment in a combat zone, and I, myself in particular, had never been to one. Well. I did the best I could with the best I could, and we shot a lot of practice bullets at a lot of practice targets, and we called in a lot of practice Kazivaks, not really thinking, you know, we would ever use such a thing. Well, you know, things changed pretty quickly in 2010. 
uh, September. We said goodbye to our families. Some people ultimately said goodbye forever. And then uh, ultimately, we were sent to Sangin Valley, Afghanistan in Helmand Province. Um, upon hitting the ground, getting out of our Hueys and Halos, Helos, we hit the ground running, some under fire, quickly we realized, you know, this is a combat zone, it's not, this isn't different, this, this is, this is real, this isn't, this isn't a game anymore, we're getting shot at, and I'm telling people to shoot back, you know, I'm not, I'm not just shooting back, I'm telling people how to shoot, where to shoot, when to shoot, we're calling on the radio, what to shoot, and planes are coming, and helicopters are coming, and it's crazy. It's the most invigorating and thrilling and frightening moment of my life. And I was excited. I was, I was happy to be there. I was happy to be fighting. I was happy to be doing what I'd been training to do. I was happy. I was just plain thrilled. The adrenaline pump from getting shot at and landing in a combat zone was just surreal. You know, it's the most pure high that I've, I mean, I've smoked marijuana and I've dabbled in a couple of psychedelics in my life, but adrenaline and in that type of environment, that white knuckle movement is the purest form of living, I guess, in my mind. That's why people become war mongrels, you know, bloodlust. And I was happy to be there. Very happy to be there. By the end of the fourth day, a good friend of mine, my first bunk mate, Sparks, he took an AK round to the chest. I carried his body with three other Marines to the helicopter with an IV in him as if he had a chance and we all knew he was already gone. Four days later, we lost four more Marines in an IED attack. It exploded a vehicle, all four of them died. My best friend was the gunner. The guy that I met in boot camp and became close with. Joseph Rodewald, my, Ger my Gerber, my Gerber baby. I called him Gerber because he looked like the Gerber baby, which was just the most amazing thing to me. They called guardian angels over the wire and I knew they were gone. That was four more Marines. We're at five and we're only five days in. Four days later, another update, three more Marines are gone. We're at eight. You start to think, well, I mean, is it gonna be me? Am I gonna die? I'm just a kid. A few days later, another Marine dies. We're at nine. And we're celebrating the Marine Corps birthday. We're celebrating the Naval birthday. We have cake. They brought steak and lobster. I'm in a combat zone fighting for my country and my brothers to the left or right of me and I'm eating birthday cake on my birthday with steak and lobster. I'm filthy. I have just gotten out of one of the longest firefights of my career. I've just killed people. I'm eating cake and lobster and steak and I love it. I'm having the time of my life. This is what I trained for. This is what I'm good at. So in the Marine Corps, I became an 0351, which is an assault man. It's a demolitions expert. It's a, a math guy. I'm able to do a cube root in my head and understand the newt, which is the, the weight of an explosive, and how far I can stand from it and not kill me or my friends. So I'm a weird nerd running around with a bunch of explosives in a combat zone, and I like being there. So it's getting weird by like the third month. December 6th, 2010, Lance Corporal Colton Rusk was on a convoy in the Wadi in Sangin Valley and the front vehicle hit an IED. 
Over the net, we were told that the vehicle hit an IED, so we told the dog handler to push out and look for secondary IEDs, which he found. Eli found and marked, was able to mark secondary IEDs so nobody else would hit those. And at least we didn't have to worry about somebody losing a leg today. But then a machine gun burst opened up and it hit Colton in the leg, in the chest, in the shoulder, and in the neck. Uh, as this Marine laid there, bleeding out, he had the audacity or the testicular fortitude to look up and use rank and say, help me, Corporal. Not help me, not help, but help me, Corporal. This is an 18-year-old man from Orange Grove, Texas, who handles a dog and finds bombs and drugs and, and guns better than any Marine I've ever seen in my life. And as he gives the ultimate sacrifice for his country, he uses rank. Why he does it. Uh, the next month, January 15th, 2011, my vehicle was struck by an IED. Ultimately, I was unconscious and out of the vehicle and pretty banged up. I didn't know what was happening, what was going on, but I stood up, regained my composure and went on about it like a man, treated for my wounds and Back to the fight, I went. Within days, I became cold, remorseless. I never did anything like war crimes. I never killed any innocent people, but I never gave a semi-guilty man a chance, neither. If you pointed a big stick in my direction wearing tennis shoes and I thought I was okay with shooting you, you got shot. Upon coming back from uh, war, uh, I seen my mother and family on the parade deck and I met them with open arms and I loved it. Uh, the next day, I was presented an award in formation in front of thousands of Marines and their families. And I'll, I'll read it for you if I can read it for you. And this uh, right here is the Secretary of Defense, Honorable Mr. Gates who flew to Sangin Valley, Afghanistan to shake my hand, shake other men like me's hands, other Marines' hands, and thank them for their service, for their actions on days like these that I'm about to read and give awards like the ones I was given for these actions. The Department of the Navy, this is to certify the Secretary of the Navy has awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal with Combat Valor, Zachary R. Arnold, United States Marine Corps, for professional achievement and his superior performance of his duties while serving as a machine gunner. Combined anti-armor team two. Weapons Company 3rd Battalion 5th Marines from 1 October 2010 to 5 March 2011. In the support of Operation Enduring Freedom 10 Tac 2, Sergeant Arnold, an assaultman by trade, demonstrated a mastery of all heavy machine guns organic to the combined anti-armor team platoon. During this period, Corporal Arnold further distinguished himself by his continuous lethal employment of weapon systems outside of his military occupational speciality. His ability to adapt and overcome within a combat environment is an example to all Marines to emulate. During his time in Sangin, Sergeant Arnold's aggressiveness, warrior mentality, and weapons proficiency directly resulted in a total of 10 enemy killed in action and multiple improvised explosive device interdictions. Furthermore, his technical proficiencies concerning demolitions enabled his platoon to conduct dismounted operations and accomplish the mission without fail. Sergeant Arnold's initiative, perseverance, and total dedication to duty reflected credit upon himself and were in keeping with the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the United States Naval Services. C.C. C. Griffin, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Marine Corps Command, given the 23rd date of August, 2011. What hits me hard here is the aggressiveness, the warrior mentality, and the weapons proficiency directly resulted in 10 enemy killed in action. This was possibly the worst day of my life. I thought I was gonna die. Pinned down and getting shot at, shooting back and trying to shoot back but failing miserably and then running out of ammunition. And picking up my enemy's weapon, neutralizing him, neutralizing his friend, running around the corner, shooting him and his friend, picking up another weapon and doing the same thing. 
They give awards for that. They give, they give, they give you awards for killing people. I have post-traumatic stress disorder. Every night, almost, I have night terrors. I'm not crazy. I'm probably one of the most intellectual, charismatic, conversationalists you'll ever meet. If you met me in public, you wouldn't see these eyes full of tears. You wouldn't see my hands stressed or the palms sweaty. You wouldn't know I was a Marine. You wouldn't know I was in combat. Men like me are all over the place. Too many of them are killing themselves. Places you come to often? Uh, yeah. Pretty much every morning. I'll stop in here, grab some coffee, grab some breakfast. Coffee and a stammy at Benjamin's. It's a good little place. Post up, you know, unwind, people watch. Get a little reading in if you want. You know, good selection of random stuff. So it's calm, it's calmy. Coffee houses are a hub for interpersonal communication my mindset, so not only can I observe people in their, you know, <laughs> early morning groggy state, but I can also see them in their business setting, in their interview setting. You know, some people come in as retirees, and this is, you know, their adventure for the day. They come out, and this is what they do. They'll come read the newspaper or something at the coffee house. So, I mean, being at the age I am, and the situation I am, it's it's peculiar for a lot of people to see me sitting here when they're sitting here because they're like, well, what's this young person doing? And I call the house, uh, I'm retired and I should be called the house by myself. And it's not that they're upset with me, I think it's just uh, it leaves an opening for conversation and um, a closing of the generational gap because you know, so many gen generations are doing what their generation is doing, what their peer groups are doing, rather it be it. You know, assisted living in nursing homes, or uh, working a nine to five, or university bound, college life. Most people and their peers are doing kind of the same thing. Everybody's doing mostly the same thing. So a lot of the mindset isn't necessarily closed off, but it's narrowed. And so I, I think for myself, it's just cool to be put into this position. Not cool to be put in this position from what I had to deal with and what I've experienced, but a blessing in a sense to be in this position, to be able to interact with multiple facets of life. these games ever take you back a place? Uh, not too much. I mean, maybe a memory or reflection. When you when you're playing? Yeah, I mean, it just depends on the weapon system. I dealt with a lot of heavy weapon systems, so inside of these games, you don't really employ or have a chance to use the weapon systems I use. So. True. But, I mean, there was one that had Mark 19s. I can't remember which game it was. I think it was Battlefield 3. But you was playing a uh, a level that had part 19s, and yeah, I was fucking like doing oh shit, and then thinking back like yeah. oh shit.
Welcome. Welcome. Uh -huh. Probably a bit more uh, stuff in here. It's a nice little cozy spot. It's not bad. In here you got a fridge. See? Little fridge. The full size microwave. You can fit, you know, who knows? A turkey in that microwave if you wanted to. <laughs> little here's and there's, you know, some utensils and bowls and such. Yada. The necessities of life. For preparation and such. Everything that I could possibly need. Oh, except for apparently this bowl. Apparently, I don't need. So I think rather it be fish, veggies, service of plate and food. Pretty much everything that I need is covered in here. I've got a dresser, six drawers, here let me move this out of the way. The bed has been complete. Yeah, there's a nice little bed up here. I can just... <coughs> so. I took a full size bed frame and put a queen size mattress on it that way I could fold the mattress up like this so if I did have passengers that were riding along not on the couch they could kind of you know just like lounge and have the full front window but at the same time you know it's it's cozy I think it'll work just fine in between every place that I'm going anywhere that I need to go I got as much room as I could possibly need to do anything I want. Table moves. I can get inside, down over here. There's the trash can and such. You know. There's a hole that goes back there. You can see that. And it follows to the back. It goes back there. There's plugs and such. But um, in the very back, I custom built, which I'll show you from the back side. I custom built a little area for my cat. I have a Siamese ragdoll, Zaza. And just in case we're on the road and I'm not in the vehicle and she wants to hide or go wherever, you know, she can escape the excitement of the mobile schoolie and enter her own little world. You can see she's got a lot of... That's her little spot. She likes to chill right here in the corner. But yeah, just about anything I could possibly need, I've already thrown in here. I have an entertainment center that I'm going to put up there, a TV that moves. Basically, the uh, premise of having these schoolies is to take veterans like myself who uh, have combat PTSD and might not necessarily be the most um, functional members of society as per standards of society, and I'm going to take school buses that we can find, help them strip it completely, run it down, rip all the seats out. We'll put a slub floor down, put the floor down, run some electrical cabinets and woodwork if they want it, and then install a bed, shower, washer, amenities, anything they want, you know? If it's a large bus and they have a big family, I mean, we can take a full-size bus with like 13 windows and I can probably put two bedrooms in there with legitimately like four full-size beds, a full shower, washer, dryer, full kitchen, a uh, living room area. This is a short bus. It's only six windows. And I mean, I have a, a bed and a kitchen and a living room and an office space. Outside, I have a grill mount. You know, there's a lot going on. Let me take you outside. Let's see what we got. Since we're speaking of it. On top, I have eight 100 watt solar panels and they're daisy chained, right? I think it's what it's called. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. I'll either blow myself up or the power will work when I turn it on. But let me show you what it looks like in the back. I had never done solar before, but I'm a Virgo, so we just do everything ourselves until we learn. And my first go of solar was taking this map 
that they sent with the kit that I bought and put it together. I had to figure out how to run my wires from the top into my bus down into here. I had to run it, the panels had to run to a combiner box, from the combiner box to a DC main disconnect, from the DC main disconnect, and I need the charge controller, the battery disconnect, all the batteries, I need the inverter, the inverter disconnect, you know, so I got both two batteries over there, 12 volts, and then my 1500 inverter, and then the battery disconnect, the inverter disconnect, the power control box, and then over here is the DC main disconnect and the combiner box. I'm not an electrician. Um, like I said in, in the Marine Corps, I dealt with demolitions. Pretty good. I'm pretty good at numbers, pretty good at math, repetition, if you will. So I just figured I would figure it out, and I did, I guess. <laughs> it works for me. Um, my toilet's tucked back there, if, if you see it. This is the custom box that I built, so I have some storage back in there on that side i have my grill stored and i have a few tools that'll be stuffed in here on this side where you can't see the wall it's back in here tucked back into this little alleyway right here right around the corner is where zaza's little pen is this is where all of her stuff is that'll be her little bed and i'll put her litter box and stuff back here but anywhere anytime she wants to escape she can just hop right on in there but yeah first go at it a little storage on the back up on the bottom i'll be able to throw in like camping gear and such like that. The first go at it, I'm, I'm pretty excited to see where it goes. How you doing? Come on in. So you're sitting in the driver's seat. What what inspires you to do this? All this? Uh, we know my buddy Milo, Milo Emery, who uh, tragically ended his own life. built a uh, self-sustaining off-grid vehicle for himself and uh, he asked me you know if you had to you had no other choice you had to restart you know with nothing from nothing you know, what would be your priorities of life what you know what would you do how would you do it you know and in and out of conversation for a few months what would you want what would you need obviously solar was a big thing space storage engine work you know Milo built himself a box truck and left California and went to Arizona to explore this life of uh, minimalism and self-sustainability and uh, for some reason he decided to end his own life and uh, succumbed to his demons his combat PTSD my memory was my confidant. He was, he was my best friend. A man that I trusted with some of the most personal details of my own demons. And uh, through his loss, you know, it, it shocked me for a moment into despair and didn't know what to do, how to do, or, you know, where to go from there. fell into drinking a lot daily you know nothing too crazy I didn't fight I'm an amateur MMA artist so obviously if I want to fight I'll just fight inside the cage I took a few fights that I shouldn't have taken at unhealthy weights and short fight notices obviously the outcome wasn't the one that I wanted or expected I had an ego check um, at that time, the love of my life walked away from me because I gave her no other option. It sobered me up. I stopped drinking. And within 60 days, I traded my HHR from a guy in Lebanon for this vehicle, a 1984 International School Bus. 
I uh, sobered up, started a nonprofit, a 5013C called My Brother's Bus, and from here I plan to use this platform of newfound uh, life, the invigoration for life, this newfound club. I'm going to use My Brother's Bus as a catalyst to get out there and help guys with combat PTSD, individuals that need help, guys that, guys and girls that aren't necessarily you know, a burden to society or themselves, but don't really fit in with the normal five to nine lifestyle. There's just too much going on in a hypervigilant mind for them to sit down with one mundane task and just you know, drain life away. So I want to get them out of a mortgage that they're you know, maybe upside down on or out of an apartment that they're wasting money on and use the money that they do have, what little they do have from the VA and their disability standpoint for their PTSD wounds from combat and I want to help them get on their feet and out and into the world. Self-sustainability is, is the key. Sustain. Like combat, we were all taught to sustain and I want to help other people in my position not feel these emotions that I'm feeling now with, I, with even the memory of Milo Emery. Peaceful, man. It's calm. surreal right it's all bliss out here calm and the birds the water the wind it's peace but in here it's chaos I think not that I think I know that with my brother's bus and this standpoint that I am this junction juncture that I am at in my life, this fork in the road, left or right path, where to go, how to be. I think it's not only good for me in finding my own peace and dealing with the loss of Milo Emery and more. It's gonna help me come to terms with myself, come to terms with life in itself, death more so, what are we all afraid of? We're all afraid of living, in my opinion. We're afraid of ourselves. We're not really afraid of each other. We're afraid of ourselves. We're afraid of death in any form or fashion. We're afraid of not being loved. And growing old. Unwanted. Men and women like myself fought for this country. My friends died for this country. Every day, 22 or more take their own life. And that's tragic. It's a cause that's worth a look. Uh, men and women just like myself. Who deserve a chance, they deserve a family, they deserve happiness and bliss. Like this. This is what the world's meant to be. But because of what's inside. Some may never happen. That's a reality that's hard for some people to face, but silently, men like myself, we, for a time where we stood together as men, for a cause, right now, 
many are lost, but they have no cause. Uh, my goal is to give it back. Thank mm -hmm. you.